Hello again. Uh, for those of you who listened to the story about the stolen meat and um, the reference to the policeman who, involved, who was involved in it, named Ron, known as Ron the Rosa, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but we referred to the policeman as Rosas in those days. Never did find out what the Rosa bit meant, but anyway, it seemed to fit him, Ron the Rosa. Um, I should have actually, with the, the meat one, I had intended to call that uh, Rufus cases the joint and the do that was the name of the dog Rufus I don't know what his real name was I called him Rufus because he was all shaggy and quite an interesting looking character and the teeth but anyway uh, this one is about Ron Ron as I briefly described in the other vid was um, about 20 27, 28 stone, about six foot tall, um, built out the original BSH, um, very big bluff character, you know, he was obviously relied totally on his size and his, you're not going to mess with the ROM if you know it's good for you. Um, but he was quite a nice bloke actually, he was quite affable and I think as long as everybody was in line he was quite happy to ride around on his scooter which in itself was quite an event. The scooter was a Vespa 125, a grey one with just one seat on it and Ron was when he was sitting on it with his big coat and his hat on all you could see was the two wheels at the bottom and the rest of it was just covered in Ron. And he used to go around like Valentino Rossi. Um, slightly slower than Valentino, but nevertheless, taking corners and, you know. Bear in mind, in those days, there was not a lot of traffic on the road, so it wasn't quite as hairy as it sounds. He was mainly, um, well, he was a local Bobby, covered all the area of uh, Barlaston. In those days, they did used to have um, police houses and policemen that covered a fair area and was responsible for all the crime and lack of crime or whatever it was in that area. So, Ron, one of the things he, he did, and it was a voluntary thing, was he used to get involved with the concerts at Trenton Gardens. In those days, in the early 60s, we used to go down to Trenton Gardens on a Friday night to watch bands that were in the same era as the Beatles. And um, most of them, the Beatles did actually appear there, but I couldn't go because I haven't got the money to for a ticket and it, they were so sold out that quick. I wasn't really that bothered about not seeing them because apparently you couldn't hear a thing. Everything was just screaming and shouting and it was just chaos. Some good bands actually down there, you know, with bands like Manfred Mann, Joe Brown, um, Mercy Beats, Foremost, mm, all the ones who were around. Mm, there was one or two bigger league ones, but like the Beatles, but that was normally the standard thing. But good. But there was no security on this place, and it was mayhem, absolute mayhem. It was Friday night. It's all right for fighting. And that's exactly what happened. Some of the fights and things, people are getting too drunk and it's crazy, just crazy. So eventually, I think people reported or got reported and they hired the police who came on their days off. So they were paid by Trenton to do it. Ron came down and Ron always had this big torch in his coat. And he was showing us one day around the top, which was about that big. I don't know if you can see that properly. But he'd got this big torch with a head on it, with all the indentations around it. And he says, that's where people bump into it. <laughs> yes. Then he was bumping into them, or they were bumping into his um, torch. 
but he used to refer to it quite openly as his cosh. He didn't carry a truncheon or anything, that was his cosh. I mean, in those days, you'd never get away with it now, or, or maybe you would, I don't know, but anyway. One of the nights when I first saw him in action down there, there was about six guys involved in the fight. Right? Ron goes across, doesn't run. Ron walks across, starts pulling them apart. One of them sees him coming and goes to throw a punch at him. Not a good plan. Not a good plan. Ron was moving his torch from out of his coat, just as this bloke was throwing the punch, and hit his fist on this torch. Oh, you could almost see him. He got a fair crack, and he could hear the, the noise almost. And then he decided to sort the other ones out. There was bodies all over the place. But the job was done, and all they would just do was kick him through the door. And after a while, the word got out that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to go down there on a Friday night for a punch-up, or to cause a bit of mayhem, because it was a lot. And, and a lot of the guys who were, uh, were fairly local, and a lot of them worked in the pits and places and were pretty tough characters. But Ron and one or two others, there was only maybe two, three cops there, so and you know, could have a crowd of about 3,000 people. But most people went down there to enjoy the concert, <laughs> not to get involved in a bundle. Moving on a little bit. My brother was going out with a girl who was later his wife from around the Hart Cell area of Stoke-on-Trent. He used to go up there, catch the bus up there. He did have an Austin 7 car for a while a very early one, and it was a little tub of a thing that wouldn't really pull your hat off, and no matter about anything else, constantly broke down. And he actually had, on the back of it, two white handprints on the back of the car that said, push here, and you often had to do just that. This particular day, he was coming back at night time from seeing it. And he'd gone to Trentham, he got a bus to Trentham, and then he walked from Trentham to Barlaston, which is probably about three miles. Walking down Barlaston, and it's Barlaston Old Road, and it's about 10.30 at night time. Can you imagine in those days, no traffic, hardly at all. The chances of getting a lift were pretty much zero. And he described it as, all of a sudden he could hear this noise come in, sounding like a big angry bee. And he's all, oh. But he could tell it was some form of motor coming. As it happened, it was Ron on his scooter, doing his Valentino act round the corners and everything. Anyway, he came along doing about, he probably wasn't doing any about more than 50 miles an hour, if that. But anyway, he comes hurtling down and then he sees my brother, anchors up, and pulls up by the side of him. Where are you going, youth? Uh, home. Where's home? Uh, Brookhouse Drive. Get on the back. No, would you like a lift or anything? It's an order. Get on the back. Well, on the back of this was just his back bit was a tin toolbox, no seat, tin toolbox. You sat on there, you're in danger of sliding straight off the back of it. But anyway, he gets on the back of there, and the only thing he's got to hold on to is Ron. So he gets his arms halfway round Ron, and you wouldn't get him any further than halfway anyway, and hangs on for dear life, and he takes off. And off he goes, whoa! And he said he's going around these bends and everything. Luckily for him, he couldn't see where he was going because he was covered in wrong. Gets to where we lived, anchors on, pulls up. My brother gets off. Thank you very much. Man, how you go? Whomp. And off he goes. When he came in, he said, you never guess what's just happened to me. And for quite a long time after that, he used to tell that story and everybody used to cripple themselves at laughing. One of the best ones wrong. See you later on. Toodle-oh.